So um, hello everyone and welcome to the first uh, first experimental method in this webinar. And this is part of the Global Observatory of Long-Term Care. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of what we are going to do today. Um, first, Adelina Comas Herrera is going to introduce the Global Observatory of Long-Term Care. And then I will very briefly introduce the quasi-experimental method interest group. And then we'll have a presentation looking at health shocks and housing downsizing among other people and, uh, by Cristina Villaplana Prieto from the University of Murcia in Spain. And then we're going to have the discussion Q&A, and this is going to be chaired by Bram Baltesher, sorry about the pronunciation. And, um, and we're going to discuss obviously the paper, but at the same time at the end, we're going to talk a bit about what we want to achieve with this uh, interest group. So Adelina, over to you. So yes, uh, hello everyone. And I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Global Observatory of Long-Term Care. Some of you may be new to it, and uh, some of you, I think, may have heard this before, so apologies. But yeah, um, the Global Observatory of Long-Term Care is part of the International Long-Term Care Policy Network. The motivation behind it is that we know that long-term care is very important because more of us will need care for longer all over the world, but yet we know that there's still a lot of progress to be made to ensure that all countries have accessible, affordable, and high quality long-term care to respond even to the current demand for care. And uh, obviously research is very important to, to help inform countries making decisions. And we're very lucky to have had some support from LSE Innovation and also from the Care Policy and Evaluation Center to create this observatory of long-term care. It builds on the LPC COVID initiative that I, I know many of you were involved, where we played a key role as a research community, shining light into what was happening in terms of COVID deaths in care homes. And uh, that was hugely impactful, and, but it also, I think, showed the, what researchers can do when we come together and how there isn't really very clear other alternative to in terms of international cooperation in long-term care and I think we have an opportunity to come together and do a lot and uh, it was amazing how in, during this uh, LTC COVID collaboration we ended up with 37 country reports and a website with almost half a million views and we did more than 30 webinars and I think we all felt that we were building something really useful and the Global Observatory is a way of giving a response. The observatory is a platform for transnational learning to improve and strengthen care systems. It's, as I said, it's part of the International Long-Term Care Policy Network. The aim is to identify key shared challenges in long-term care and showcase how different countries and localities are addressing them. And research is a key way of understanding this and of, of also showing what's working and not, and also to facilitate collaborations. And we hope that we will be reaching policymakers and uh, industry advocates, care professionals. And of course, we have already a lot of academics that are part of it, but this is open to everybody who's interested. And in terms of how to engage, well, the first thing you can do is to go to the website. Some of you know it already, some of you may not. Uh, on the website, there are different sections. We have an experts directory. We have um, a register of research projects where you can basically enter details of your research project and it creates a mini web page where you can share outputs and make people aware of the work you're doing. We are also developing long-term care system profiles and we have quite a few under development and some already online uh, covering at the moment Costa Rica, Greece, uh, Sweden and Japan. We also are developing gradually bibliographies on key topics on long-term care and also the tools, methods, and researchers that help us do research. And in fact, this interest group is looking particularly at methods, which is very important for all of us working on research. And the way that we collaborate and come together is mostly also through the interest groups. And I'm delighted to welcome the quasi-experimental methods group. It's fantastic to have this first webinar. This is a list of the ones that we have 
of life at the moment with about what uh, one on pain in uh, care homes, pain management in care homes, and another one on long-term care and climate change, and also one on care and social protection in Southern Africa. So as you can see, we have very diverse topics. We're very open to suggestions. If you'd like to suggest um, a, a group, uh, please uh, do let me know. I'm very happy to speak on the chat. And um, yeah, you can see that the first step to be part of the observatory is to register as an expert, and then you'll be part of this searchable experts directory that enables us to find people with similar interests and uh, in working, for example, in particular countries you want to know more about. And you can also um, subscribe to our new newsletter is sent at the end of the month with a digest of recent news and obviously interesting events that you can join. In terms of next webinars, we're about to advertise very soon uh, one on long-term care policy on the 26th of February, linked to the long-term care policy interest group. On the 7th of March will be the first webinar of the economics of long-term care interest groups. And 15th of March, I think we will have the first one from the care and social protection in Southern Africa. And I know there's another one coming soon uh, for sure on uh, data science, uh, where we already had one before. And uh, finally, I wanted to also make sure that you all know about the next uh, International Long-Term Care Policy Network Conference. It will be in Vizcaya in Spain in September. And we hope that many of the interest groups might be able to come together through organized sessions. The call for abstracts is about to come out in the next few days. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. And uh, really looking forward to this webinar. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of the quasi-experimental uh, method interest group, so our main motivation is to try to bring together academics, policymakers, and practitioners that have an interest in knowing how we could better evaluate causal effects on long-term care policy and intervention. So I think that the, the group will be strongly methodological, but we're, I think we will also see uh, a potential to shed light of what works in long-term care because we are going to be looking at the evidence. Uh, and in this sense, we believe that method matters and they can have a real impact. Uh, more specifically, um, our main aim as an interest group is to provide a platform for knowledge exchange and also generating new methodological ideas. Uh, and ultimately, what we want to do is to announce the quality of research in the area of long-term care. So either sharing your own work, sharing the work of others, bringing methods from another disciplines that we can implement in long-term care um, will be more than welcome. And also what will be uh, I want to emphasize that everyone is welcome, although it's a strong, strongly methodological uh, interest group. Um, the idea that we will talk technical stuff, uh, we also uh, we will do in an accessible manner. Uh, and, and so everyone will feel like they are understanding what is happening, and what we are doing, and why we are doing it. Um, at the moment, the steering group uh, include Bram uh, Pesher uh, from the School of Health Policy and Management at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Then we have Joaquin Mayorga, he's from the Department of Social Policy at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And myself, Javier Cartagena Farias at the Care Policy and Evaluation Center, also at LSC. Um, so last time I looked at the website, uh, this interest group had 20 members. And we have expertise from 13 countries, perhaps a bit more because some people have uh, international expertise. And it happened to be that these 20 members are all researchers, all academic. So I really want to emphasize that uh, if there is any policymaker or practitioner in this call, or if you know somebody who may be interested, um, please tell them that they will be more than welcome. And it's very important for us to have this diversity. Um, um, if you want to join the interest group, uh, just go to the website that Adelina mentioned before, uh, the Global Observatory of Long-Term Care. Look for the past uh, experimental interest group, and then you complete a very short uh, form, just your contact details, and you will be able to join. And, and as Adelina said, you can create a little profile of yourself as well, if you want. Uh, and now, uh, just because we want to hear what you think about what we should do in 
um, within the interest group activities and what is important for you and what you would like to achieve. Uh, if you're a member, uh, we have a, a, a very short poll that should appear very soon automatically in your screen. So if you just put answer the questions, then we can discuss them at the end of the webinar. Class. Thank you for the opportunity to share the results of this paper. So first of all, I would like to thank also Professor Joan Gustafson because this is a joint work with him. So I am at the University of Murcia, which is a small city in the south of Spain. So just a brief introduction. So these are the projections of the population between 2019 and 2070. So more like a population pyramid, it looks like a mushroom or a base, but this is eventually what we will find in the next future. Also, we find the projections of Alzheimer's disease prevalence in 2050. So for Europe, we will have instead of 7 million, 16.5 million, 9 million in the early stage of the disease, 7.5 million in the late stage of the disease. And also we have the bibliography of population disabilities according to age in 2021. So we observe an increase in the percentage of people, especially women with severe disabilities for the cohort 85 and more. 38% are suffering a severe disability. So in this scenario, we face an important dilemma. Stay at home in all place, in this case, receiving the necessary attention, whether using formal care, household employees, or informal care, or moving to another household. And in this case, we have the alternative of downsizing. So today, Little is known about the behavioral motivations of individuals when they decide to move and also to downsize. But before what is to downsize, well, the literature is not pretty clear because some authors consider that downsizing is moving to a smaller space and reducing personal possessions. Others use a more broad definition and include a reduction in the value of the dwelling. So in this paper, we are going to consider both definitions and we will explore the possibility of moving to a dwelling with fewer rooms and also the reduction in the value of the dwelling with respect to total wealth. With respect to motivation as well, a priori we could think that older households tend to be in disequilibrium because they consume more housing that they really need in that moment of their lives. And this phenomena may give rise to a bottleneck in the housing market. Other people may think that they are going to preserve these housing assets as a self-insurance to support themselves in case they need. And in fact, some papers point to this theory, for example, a paper at Calvo and others in 29, he observed that those who move after a health shock experience an average decrease in home value of about $26,000, as opposed to those who move but without suffering a health shock. And in this case, they move to another household with a higher value around $33,000 more expensive. However, we could think the other way around. Health shocks can also inhibit downsizing decisions if they signal uncertainty on future medical expenses. For example, in the case of Spain, given the uncertainty surrounding our long-term care dependency systems that has some years with more resources and other years with less resources, people, people could think that household is an asset of last resort that will be used, for example, for paying a private nursing care or supporting a surviving spouse. So to explore these theories, we are going to use data from CERN 
I think that all of you know Sir, which is the Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe. We are going to use waves one, two, four, five, and six because wave three is the commonly named cell life that is completely different. We're going to select individuals that participate in all waves. So we have a balanced panel, panel data sample of about 33,000 observations and 6,700 individuals. For all the countries, we have around 6.5% that have change of residence between two consecutive waves. We have information of non-mental illness, degenerative mental illness, other mental disorders, and disabilities for activities in daily living in the baselines, and also what we define as a health shock that is suffering a new, for example, non-mental illness or an increase in ADL between two consecutive waves. So I want to highlight the fact that the percentage corresponding to degenerative mental illness for the whole sample is only 1.44%. However, as we will see later on, degenerative mental illness are very, very important in explaining thousands in decisions, as well as an increase in disabilities for daily living. Well, I'm going to skip this part, but given that we have selected individuals that participate in all ways, we have tested the existence of attrition bias. So we have estimated the corresponding attrition province and making point tests for the equality of coefficients from the in initial sample with and without attritors. And the results confirm that attrition is random and it's not going to bias the results for the remaining sample. The three variables that we are going to analyze are the following. The change of residence, that takes the value one if the individual has change of residence between two consecutive survey waves. Home value to wealth ratio. So first we compute the wealth ratio, which is the sum of bank accounts, bond stock and mutual funds. Savings for long-term investments, value of own businesses, value of home, value of cars, and value of other real estate. And we compute the ratio of the value of the home with respect to total wealth. So this is a fractional variable. And also we have the difference in the number of rooms. For those individuals who have changed of residence, we have information about the number of rooms before and after excluding including bedrooms, but excluding the kitchen, bathrooms, and hallways, and we compute the difference. With respect to health socks, for both the respondent, and in case of having a partner or a spouse, we also have merged information to combine these new variables. We define SOC corresponding to non-mental illness that denote suffering a heart attack, stroke, cancer, or lung disease, mental degenerative illness, Alzheimer disease and Parkinson, we have separated these mental illnesses from other mental disorders that is not saying that I'm depressed, it's saying that you are have, uh, taking drugs for anxiety or depression. And also, if the individual has suffered an increase in limitation for personal activities of daily living. We have also the health status in the first wave at baseline. We include sociodemographic characteristics, the typical ones, age, sex, marital status, education, relation with economic activity, income, household size, and the size of municipality. And also we include if the household has performed home adaptations. In this case, the question is not very specific. It includes whether you have widened doors or corridors, ramps of street level entrances, handrails, automatic or easy open doors or gates, what we cannot distinguish among these home adaptations. And we also include country and regional fixed effects. So some pictures in this graph, you observe the probability of having change of residence between two consecutive waves. So the probability is higher for the lines in black and in green. And above the graph, you observe that these lines correspond to changes between four and five and changes between five and six. So the probability of having change of residence is higher as the individual gets older, which is quite interesting. And also with this very typical is that the probability of having suffered a health shock increases always 
as individual is always for all ages and for always. So this is also um, a map of the European countries that have participated. And it's just to motivate that there is a high degree of heterogeneity because at the end of the paper, we are going to classify the countries in Northern, Southern and Central European countries. So not taking into account the incidence of a health shock, you appreciate that, for example, the rate areas indicate that in this case, moving is more associated to a reduction in the number of bedrooms, which is more clearly observed in France and Italy. In blue, the navy blue bricks denote the percentage of households who have moved to a house with lower value with respect to total wealth, which is higher in Sweden and in Denmark and in Germany. And green circles, the percentage of households that have moved to lower value housing, which is almost not existence for the case of Spain and Italy. Also, we have to pay attention to endogenous problems. For example, the incidence of a health shock, when you want to explain that this variable is a regressor in an equation for change of residence, you may face a problem of endogeneity. I will explain that more detailed afterwards, but we have proposed the following instruments. Being a smoker or former smoker, being obese or overweight, regular alcohol consumption and sedentary lifestyle. And also when you introduce the change of residence in the equation for the ratio of home value with respect to total wealth, you may have a problem of endogeneity. And in this case, our proposed instruments are the cooling and heating degree days with our very nice variables that are provided by Aerostat. And these are really the number of days. If an, is this is an index that denotes the amount of air condition or the amount of heating according to the situation of your region. For example, in the case of Murcia, now we have 25 degrees. So it's clear that the necessary of having heating is not really. But when we have more than 40 degrees in June and July, we need cooling. Housing price index, the growth rate of housing price index and the number of daughters at home. So this is, for example, in the case of United States, they have observed that retired couples are more prone to move to warmer areas. So this is the fundamental for including heating and cooling degree days. And these are the summary of statistics. You observe that the maximum of heating degree days correspond to Sweden and the minimum to Canary Islands. Housing prices. Lower house prices lend to lower household mobility because more risk averse people do not want to sell their property for less than what they had paid before. And the reduction in the value of the house may limit the amount of potential mortgage that could be obtained for the new house. So I'm going to explain very briefly the three models. The first one is a dynamic profit estimator for the change of residence when you include having change of residence in the previous period, health shocks of the respondent, health shocks of the partner, a vector of explanatory variables, a, a variable including the unobservable heterogeneity and the error term. So in principle, you could use the Woolrich conditional maximum likelihood estimator. However, now we introduce the possibility that health shocks are potentially endogenous because perhaps people who are more susceptible to suffer health shocks, for example, a fall, may live in poor housing conditions. And some people may see their home as a life worth in the event of high medical expenses and may be reluctant to sell it. So in this picture, each point represents an act, a region, and the red line is the locally weighted regression of changes in housing mobility over changes in the occurrence of health shocks. More or less, you appreciate a positive slow, positive association. So we propose a dynamic correlated random effect model because the pure random effects model could be really unrealistic. So first, we perform a regression for each of the health shocks by pool OLS using the instruments. We obtain the residuals an average for each individual. And finally, we estimate a profit model for the probability of change of resident 
Entry in the explanatory variables, the predicted residuals, and the average of the residuals, estimated by maximum likelihood estimation. The second model, as I said before, is a variable between zero and one. So we go to the model proposed by Papke and Woolrich. But this model, to perform well, recurs to assumptions that the regressors conditional and observable heterogeneity are strictly exogenous, and also introduce the assumption of conditional normality. Well, we cannot put the hand on the fire saying that our regressors are strictly exogenous. We propose five instruments because we have the um, intuition that the change of resident may be correlated with the unobservable heterogeneity. We estimate by pool OLS from which the residuals are obtained and estimate by quasi-maximal likelihood introducing the explanatory variables, the instruments and their means and the predictions of the residuals. And finally, the easiest models is this one where we have DR is the difference in the number of rooms. We have the variable having change of residence, the health socks, and having also doubts about the exogeneity of change of residence, we follow the same procedure as before using the instruments mentioned and estimating a two-stage GMM model for residential change. Now the results. Well, in this table, we observe the first stage regression. So this is the dependent variables are the health socks. And of course, there are other explanatory variables, but in this table, I only saw the results for the instruments. I highlighted sedentary lifestyles because it has the highest impact. So non-mental illness is, in this case, for example, having a sedentary lifestyle increases by 8.82% the probability of suffering non-mental illness and increases by 6.7% the probability of suffering and increasing the limitations for ADL. So the instruments are significant and they pass all the standard tests, but as I highlight that sedentary lifestyle is the stronger prediction of future health shocks. Now we have the model for change of residence. So I only am going to show the results for correlated random regressions. So health shock is treated as an endogenous variable. So having change of residence in the past increases the probability by 4.4 percentual points of changing again of residence. You also observe that suffering a degenerative mental illness increases the probability by nine percentual points and suffering more ADL increases this probability by 6.5 percentile points. However, having performed previous adaptations and afterwards suffering a health shock reveals the opposite sign. The probability of changing of residence decreases by 11 percentual points in case of degenerative mental illness by 19.6 percentile points in case of ADL shock. For the effect of age, the coefficient I highlighted in red for both the respondent and the partner is significant and negative. It indicates that every 10 years of life implies a decrease by two percentual points in the probability of changing of residence. However, the interaction with health shock has a positive effect. Increases 22 percentile points for degenerative mental illness, nine percentile points for non-mental illness. And similar results, so negative for the age of the partner, but you are going to appreciate that the effect of suffering a health shock has a positive effect, that the interaction of the shock with con adaptations, in this case, the shock is suffered by the partner, has a negative effect, and the interaction of the age of the partner and the health shock has a positive effect. So this corroborates that there is no difference in the case of couples, people living together. Now we go to the second model. So in this case, we are going to analyze first the first stage regression. So we have the summary table with the five instruments proposed. 
So in this case, according to previous literature, the probability of changing of residence is higher if you are living in a region with heating degree days more higher and decreases with more cooling degree days. But that what I would like to highlight is the importance effect of the number of daughters at homes at baseline. In this case, you appreciate that the probability of changing of residence decreases by nearly 10 percentual points. And also you appreciate a decrease in the probability of the interaction, changing of residence, and also having suffered a health shock. So you have suffered a health shock, but in case you are living with your daughter, the probability of changing of residence decreases. Now, what happens to home value with respect to wealth? Well, we appreciate that in general, people who move, there is an increase in home value to wealth ratio by, this is important, 25 percentual points. Having suffered before at baseline health shock also has a positive effect. Suffering a new health shock is important, increases the uh, home value with respect to wealth by 19 percentile points for degenerative mental illness and by nearly 17 percentile points for ADL. However, the interaction terms reveals the important results. In case of having change of residence after suffering a health shock, in this case, the coefficients have a negative sign. So the value of the new residence with respect to your wealth is smaller, nearly 10 per, 10 per, 12 percentile points for degenerative mental illness, 15 for no mental illness, 10 for other mental disorders. And you have similar results, so this corroborates previous results for the partner. In green, you appreciate that the interaction between having change of residence and having suffered a health shock reveals a negative sign. And also other interesting results is that home value to wealth ratio increases for widows, decreases for men, which is morally associated because they are more prone to receive uh, retirement benefits. So the amount of savings, for example, in bank accounts or in funds is going to increase with respect to home value. And also there is an increase in home value with respect to wealth ratio for the courts 75, 79, 80, 84. Now for the difference in the number of rooms, if you typically buy another house, there is an increase in the number of bedrooms small, 0 0.17. For health shocks at baselines or new health shocks, there are almost no significant result. However, if you have purchased a new house after suffering a health shock, you observe that this is smaller. One bedroom less, this is significant, 1.2 for ADL, 0 0.65 for the general mental illness, 0 0.32 for other mental disorders and similar results for the interaction in the case of the partner. So you move because your and your partner has suffered a health shock. Finally, the predicted probabilities. In the yellow panel, you observe the probability of having change of residence. For example, in Denmark, without health shock, 7%, with degenerative mental illness, almost 15%. In Spain, from 3% to 13%. In the pink panel, you have the difference in home value with respect to wealth. So in Germany, there is an increase by 1% in the case of not, having, not suffering a health shock. However, a huge decrease, the highest in Germany, but also important in Austria, in Belgium, in Denmark, in Sweden, in case of suffering a degenerative mental illness, this is the difference in the ratio of home value with respect to wealth. And finally, the predicted difference in the number of bedrooms. We appreciate that in the column, no shock. The sign is always positive, but in Germany, for example, no mental illness, minus three rooms, minus 1.4 rooms, minus 1.1 rooms. 
Also, what happens with the probability of, this is an extension of institutionalization? Well, having performed previous home adaptations, the crisis, well, home institutionalization, I have to notify that um, is only temporary stays in a nursing home, only temporary stays. Home adaptations decreases this probability. Having suffered a health shock increases the probability, but the interaction between having performed home adaptation and afterwards having suffered a health shock reveals a negative effect over the probability of going three months, two months to a nursing home. And finally, the difference. When you change of residence, it not also buying another household, another dwelling, but also you move perhaps from a big city to a rural area. And this is quite interesting because in the northern countries and central countries, you appreciate that there is a higher probability of moving from big cities or large towns to small cities or rural areas. However, in southern countries, the movement is in the opposite direction. This is highlighted in yellow, from a small town or rural areas to large towns. This. Finally, the conclusions. So aging decreases the probability of residential change, but the interaction between aging and health shocks reverses design. We highlight the importance of degenerative mental illnesses and increases in ADL for explaining the decisions to downsize. However, there are people are different and some of them may manifest strong aging in place preferences. In this case, public policies should support them promoting the necessary facilities, home care, day centers to remain living in their own household. So importance for the networks created among people who want to remain living in their homes but also other people want to downsize. However, at least in Spain, it is difficult to start looking for another dwelling. So public policy should support housing search as it can have implications in delaying or avoiding entry into more costly forms of residential and hospital care. And also this has other important implications for freeing up households for younger families with kids. And in the future, we should evaluate the impact on urban and rural areas of other dwellings becoming unoccupied because in Spain there is a problem named the España vaciada that rural areas are many small towns with very very very, very uh, a few and very old inhabitants thank you very much that's our email addresses and thank you thank you very much thank you very much Christina very interesting presentation which uh, indeed uh, delivers what we promised in the sense that it's both uh, using uh, nice uh, econometric uh, methods uh, and, and have clear uh, policy uh, implications, I think. Um, so yeah, it's always a bit difficult with so many people on Zoom, but uh, let's open uh, the discussion. So if you have a question, uh, I would say turn on your camera uh, and your microphone. Uh, also good. You can also do it through the chat and then um, that's also a possibility. And then maybe in the meanwhile, I can start start by asking a question myself. Um, so if I understand correctly, there are basically, uh, I think, two reasons uh, why people would uh, change residence after a health shock. Okay? So one would be that they, uh, they they need access to their housing wealth, right? And that's very illiquid. So that's kind of stuck with in, in their bricks. So they have to basically sell their house to get access to these, these financial means. The other ones would be that they might want to move to a more suitable house. Uh, and I, I got the impression that you basically find results on both uh, both sides, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit where you what, what you think is driving the the, the effects. Okay, we find on one hand that people who have performed home adaptations, that perhaps when we analyze long-term care, we are always focused on formal care, informal care, nursing homes. But this paper, when I analyze the data, I realize that there are small things that may be very important. Perhaps people do not adapt the bathroom 
or the hallways or the corridors. But this is really important because mobility, having reduced mobility is not only bad for you, but it entails an important risk for your security. So you may have the red button, which is telecare, but also telecare is very cheap, but I would say that um, subsidies for adapting homes are important. This is one thing. The other thing is that uh, people may decide the, the underlying reason for, for deciding to move is that you have suffered a health shock and most important health shocks are degenerative mental illness. So in this case, you I, I do not have the evidence, but you want to free up resources, whether because I think that um, you need 24 hour of care and care is expensive. So at least in Spain, you can only receive 70 hours of care per month. So if you are suffering Alzheimer and you need 20, 24 hours of care continually the whole day, so you are going to receive a small amount from public resources and the rest is coming from your private phones. So my intuition is that the family is going to sell well. We are going to sell the household. You are going to move. And also we are going to combine informal care with our type of care, but this is not manageable in other way. But at before, saying that you have a same of Parkinson is something, a, a very sudden health shock. But the increase in ADL, and I say that from the, my own experience looking after my parents, this is something that comes with aging. So in this case, you may say, well, at the same time as I say, next year, I want to do this, for example, my driving license, I have to pass again my driving license. Well, next year, my parents turn 85 years old. What should I do to make their life more comfortable if they want to remain living in their own homes? One of my friends, the parents look in a, it's not very common in Spain because we, look, we live in apartment, but they live in a house and they have introduced these small leaves so because stairs may be uncomfortable and may be dangerous. So as before, yes, as you said before, you have the two alternatives. And also one of these trends, this modern trend that says you, to remain living in the community as long as possible, the evidence that the probability of, for example, you have suffered a hip fracture and you go to a nursing home for three months or four months, I know many cases, well, this possibility is reduced if you say after hospital, I know that I have everything at home, for example, in the bathroom. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very interesting. Um, uh, let's go to Javiera. She was first, I think, with raising her hand. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I have two, two questions. Um, one is, maybe I miss it, but when you look at health shocks, do you look at an individual health shock or somebody in within the household that could have like the wife or a child or whoever live with them? Is it at household level or individual level? And the other question is whether if you see somehow as a limitation of your study, the fact that you can only observe to those that have actually moved, but you don't observe basically those that haven't been able to move. May, they may want to move, but they haven't moved. So somehow it's kind of a subsample of actually those that took the decision of moving. Uh, sir, uh, respondents of SER are age 55 and 50 years and older. So you have for in if in the family the only res, the respondent is 50 years well he answers if he has suffered he or she has suffered a health shock between the past wave and the present wave and also if he is single nothing else but if the respondent has a partner or a spouse you have the corresponding code so inside the same household, the household has a code and you have 
a subindex for the respondent and another for the partner. And you also know if the respondent has a health stock and differentiate it from the health stock of the partner. So you, got, you have this separate but detailed information. And regarding your second question, yes, it's clear that the question is, have you change of residence between the survey and the survey before? But we don't have information about, did you want it to move, but you couldn't? There are other questions with respect to unmet need, but in this case, we, we lack this information. This is important, yes. Yeah, that would indeed be very interesting. And I know that some of these living surveys, they do have yes. this information, of course, but chair, uh, unfortunately not. But it's yeah, it's very similar indeed to, to unmet care need, I think, like you were saying. Um, Elena, uh, I think it's your turn. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> so thanks. First of all, Adelina and Javiera for this nice introduction and for leading uh, this group. I think it's a it's a great opportunity. So I'm very happy to join and congratulate Christina because I think it's very interesting and, and it is especially relevant because there is a scarce literature on that and, and I'm very happy to learn about that. So I don't have any question because for me it was quite clear how, how Christina present the paper, but I do have a comment. So I was working for some uh, policy issue with Catalan government. And at least in Catalonia, there is some programs that help people with frailty to uh, adapt the house. So we have these programs in which before doing the, um, the adaptations at, at home, there goes a team that is led by not physicians, but people in healthcare and people that know about uh, uh, physical limitations and all this, and is these people who are advising and they are telling whether the people need a big reform, so making like changing walls and these type of things, or a small adaptation such as uh, make, for instance, in the sofas to put something to make it higher, to make easier to stand up and all these things. And what I learned from that program is that it's not unique. I mean, there are all these type of programs regionally uh, across Europe. So my comment or suggestion is that it would be interesting whether in places which this type of programs are in place could also affect or promote more uh, all your findings. So how these social programs interact and, and how this affects. So, I mean, I was simply wanting to share the information because I think it's it would be interesting as a future line of research. Thank yes. you. Yes, and to enhance the coordination, I think, because there is very fragmented information, health information about dependency. For example, in, in Muthia, we have two parallel systems of long-term care, one provided by the town hall, another provided by the central government of Spain. So you can think that this is completely a mess to understand it, even for a, for a Spanish. Yes. Yeah, and um, I can confirm that is also the case for for the Netherlands, for example. And then maybe that's also something maybe in the future we can can spend some time on it because I think we're these kind of interventions are kind of are regional. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, this type of uh, actions or policies are like uh, municipal or regional, but at very disaggregated level, mm -hmm. and that's why it's so difficult. But I mean, having a map where this takes place and see how this affect housing would be really interesting. I think everyone, at least we would agree. Um, Jose Luis. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the presentation, Christina. It's, uh, it's, it was really interesting. And my point was actually uh, very similar to Elena's point, uh, because I was going to you know, I, I get a sense in the modeling that you've done that uh, the interpretation is about how individuals are going to sort of make decisions in the face of health shocks. Um, but uh, I remember conversations I've had with, for example, people leading the social care departments in London. London has got uh, a significant shortage of uh, housing stock. And there's a lot of pressure on local government to house people who have got housing in problems is a very very expensive thing to do and so they're desperate to um 
to sort of uh, convince all the people that are living in very large houses and that have got, um, let's say, social care needs to move to, for example, extra care facilities, which are, you know, it, it's not residential care, but it's, uh, it's, it's much better suited to their care needs. And so they are uh, implementing all sorts of um, uh, incentives and, uh, and, and local schemes in order to uh, basically facilitate that transition. And, and I was wondering whether, you know, whether it would be important to consider that in the analysis, at least in terms of uh, saying that what we observe is, is both uh, perhaps people acting on their own in terms of the, you know, the, I face a health uh, shock, I'm going to therefore, uh, you know, change my, uh, you know, my housing situation. Um, but quite often the state is going to be actually trying to incentivize uh, that that transition and actually the finding ways the best way to to make that transition successful for example in terms of also the financial side of it you know how the financial um, uh, tools that they can offer individuals in order to to be able to move um, that's something that could could be quite important in terms of policy implications yes the role of the incentives is is very important very, very important. I think the case of Spain, the, the definition of informal caregivers has been modified a little so that the the family caregiver may still be receiving the subsidy, but it's not so essential to having been living cohabiting at least one year or for residents, perhaps you could live in the next house and you go several times per day and visit your father and your mother and in and in this case yes there are some incentives here. yes it is interesting thank you and i think again also here there's these incentives are everywhere eh? so they're also on the housing market side uh, maybe also even the tech side if you think about housing well so it's a very interesting interaction uh, i see javier has her hand up. I don't know whether that's for a question or to yeah, it's, to it's exactly to end the party. Let's say yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I already it's just thought about so. time. Um, I said that we are going to talk about the what we want to achieve, and I'm just going to summarize the poll. Basically, most of the people want to see presentations on paper or methods, and then also they want to see video tutorials or method models, and perhaps to have the code to actually carry carry out the, the analysis, which is something that would be interesting to prepare. So um, I think we are trying to do a bit of that with Adelina and may have some news related to that. But just want to say thank you very much to everyone, to Bram, to Christina, to everyone who asked questions and to everyone who attended the seminar. It was um, really interesting. Um, and, and yes, there was a lot of discussion. I'm sorry for interrupting the part. Um, thank you very much and have a lovely day. Thank you.